and just not disturb the HDMI because it seems to be a bit jittery. Okay, what is minimalism? Now, minimalism has become a bit of a buzzword recently. So, you know, we're, we're all either corporate or we work with corporate, whatever. Who here has played buzzword bingo? You know, see a, a, a hands for buzzword bingo. You know, whenever you go for a talk and the CEO goes through things and you play it off and everything else, and eventually someone stands up at the back and goes, bingo, and someone wins a pineapple or something. Buzzword bingo. So we're going to go for broke. Um, because minimum is a, is a buzzword. We're going to say agile, AI ready, blockchain backed, API enabled, digitally transformed, miserable. come on, absolutely, yeah? That's, that's a buzzword, yeah? But here's the issue. Minimalism isn't a buzzword. It isn't even a process. It isn't even something you can kind of turn up in Finland and see some bold Irish guy actually talk about. It's a philosophy. It's not something you can even really do. It's a way of thinking. It's a way of changing everything that you do, changing everything that you think about, the way you code, the way you architect, the way you do HN scale. And usually when people think about minimalism, they think, okay, as an example, Occam's razor. Yeah, we all know Occam's razor. Um, which is usually quoted as the simplest solution tends to be the correct one. In short, if you have a lot of different competing possibilities to do something, then the simplest one is nearly always the best. The thing is that that is not true. It's not true as in it's not what Occam actually said. Now, I really wanted to learn the Latin for what he actually said or what's written down and everything else, which I feel that because I did feel Latin in school. Um, but it translates roughly what he actually said as plurality is never to be posited without necessity. Now what that means, um, Ockham, I believe, was actually talking about interpretations of, of, of the scripture. But what it means is that whenever you have lots of different things, it is not necessarily the simplest thing which is the best. It is the least complex thing. It is the thing which is just complex enough to describe what it is we're supposed to be doing. But it is not necessarily the simplest thing. The simplest thing can be oversimplified. Minimalism can be simplicity, but simplicity is not necessarily minimalism. Now to take kind of the canonical example of the way that works, let's take a look at sort of a, a standard architecture for pretty much any given web system, or even any given connected system. And this is the way it's kind of usually done. We've all seen this sort of stuff before. So in an extremely simple way, we have a database or a data store, um, or possibly some back-end process, something which is <laughs> kind of the core of the system from a state point of view. And on top of that, we have an application, which may be in whatever language or use whatever platform or whatever else. The whole thing sits, well, now, usually on a cloud provider. Um, usually before it would have been maybe in-prem hosted tin or whatever. These days, this could be AWS, this could be Azure, um, this could be Google Cloud, this could be anything. And then, of course, we have outside the users. Now, I've kept this as deliberately agnostic on technology as possible, but it couldn't really be more agnostic, could it? I've just put cloud and database and application user. I haven't mentioned languages. I haven't mentioned platforms. I haven't even mentioned what technology we run on, because, to be honest, it doesn't matter. The conceptual representation of what's going on here is nearly always the same. You have something behind it, like at Abyss, you have an application, and then you have, well, the users who are using it. Now, if we just take that exactly as it is from an architecture point of view, of course, we all know the usual problem with this in terms of high availability. In short, if you lose the application, you lose the entire capability to the user. No one can actually access that anymore. And this is where running where like a single instance, you know, of application. This is still depressingly common out there in business IT, if you, there, there's, there's more to it than that. It's not just the application. If you end up with a problem with your back-end data store, your back-end processing, you end up with the same sort of issue. The application can't talk to the data store processing, and the user can't access the whole thing. We've all seen this before, and this is kind of the standard problem. So that's the high availability part of it. It's not really highly available at all. If any bit of it falls over, there's single points of failure, and that's the end of it. And then there's the scalability bit of it. And like I said, I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but we're just kind of you know, running through the process. Even when it's working properly, we have maybe 100 users using a new system. 
it goes viral overnight, it gets the number one post on you know, um, Hacker Network, our news or something, or, or whatever. It goes viral on Facebook, and next thing you have 100 million people trying to look at this one application hosted exactly once somewhere. And remember, this is all still cloud. This isn't in-prem stuff from 1999, do you know what I mean? The issue is, of course, that that single application has a hard limit in terms of the number of people or users it can support. And this happens. We end up being able to support some users, and usually not very well, um, depending on how the internal uh, application architecture works. It may just not work for everybody. It may fall over completely, or only a small number of users can actually access the system. The thing is that the overall concept here is that simple systems tend to have hard limits in terms of the complexity and capability they can support, as we've seen. It's a very simple system, but it is the easiest way to look at it, something like this. Database or backend store, application, users. So, the standard way we do something about this is with the concept of we bring in simple ideas of HA and scale. So let's take a look. Um, modern system, again, cloud provider. We have a cluster of database nodes in the, in the back end or a cluster of processing something. I'm just using database as the generic sense that there is something behind the application which is actually causing things to happen. The application itself has no single points of failure in this. I'm using the AWS example of an auto-scaling group, the idea that there are many of these things, and of course they have to be written in such a way that are stateless, um, because you don't know which one you're gonna be talking to. The entire thing is behind a load balancer, and that works well for lots of users. It's not a simple solution, and that's what I'll get to kind of in just a second. So just to run through kind of the differences between that and what I'd said before, we lose one application. No problem. We have a grid behind an ASG. We have lots of instances doing the same thing. The applications are stateless, and it doesn't matter. It may get slightly slower for the users which are there, but the application overall does not fall over. A similar thing happens if we lose one of our database nodes, assuming that the cluster is well designed and working properly. Um, it's OK. The applications can still talk to the database. It still goes through the load balancer, and everything's fine. Looks great, doesn't it? So let's just compare the simple solution I talked about. A single point of failure, limited capacity, and lots of things, as we've seen, can go wrong, versus the minimal system, which is fault tolerant, which has scalable capacity, which has no single point of failure in that way. Really, the crux of this overall is that the simple solution is not the best one. The minimal solution is the best one. When we talk about MVP, everyone quotes minimum viable product. Now, that's quite interesting, because I don't really think people really think about it that way. The real takeaway from that whole phrase is actually viable, not minimal. It's easy to make a simple system. It's easy to make something you can knock up in 10 minutes. And the problem is that, especially with a lot of frameworks out there in the world, we tend to assume that if we just use whatever framework everyone is doing, then it will just work, and we'll get all of this stuff kind of like semi-magically. It's not necessarily viable to do so. Real-world systems tend to have irreducible areas of complexity, and that's kind of, that's kind of interesting. The thing is, the minimal <coughs> system is as complex as it needs to be, but no more so. But it is certainly not the simplest solution generally in the case when you're actually talking about real-world examples. So all good so far? How am I doing for time? Okay. So, how to be minimalist? And like I said, it's a philosophy. It's something. It's a way of thinking. It's not something which you can like go to a course and learn. This is kind of because it is a philosophy, sort of like just a, a set of hints and tips. But really, you're going to have to think about what it means for you. Maybe where to start is consider carefully what viable actually means to you. Do you need a system to be highly available? Do you need it to be scalable? Will you? There's the whole concept of MVP, and people tend to go, right, well, it's MVP, I'll just build it this way for now, and then we'll extend it later on. The whole phrase, you ain't never going to need it, comes to mind. But if you're really developing something, especially from scratch, you know, for a global audience, viable probably means scalability from day one. Viable probably means highly available from day one. And that's something which, again, is depressingly common. People tend to forget about the V in MVP. This one's popular as well. <laughs> Declutter your entire design stack and team. And this is to use something which is quite, 
quite sort of common right now, quite faddish in a way. Um, but in all seriousness, to misquote uh, the concept behind this, if it does not bring your users joy, throw it out. Um, what does give your users joy your, or your customers joy? Um, speed, reliability, the idea that it doesn't matter how many people are currently using the system, how many people are currently doing stuff, and more than that, you know, what the curve in terms of your customers is. How many customers will you have next month? Is that going to materially affect the experience of the customers you have now? If you can't retain customers, if you can't retain users, you don't have a scalable system. Um, to kind of go on with it a little bit more, um, and this one can be a little bit contentious, so I'm really sorry if there's anybody in the room who this one actually offends. Avoid vendor lock-in and silver bullets. Now, this one's kind of tricky. I mean, okay, I'm standing up here saying AWS is, yeah, someone's bought it. <laughs> I don't, I'm not going to stand up here and say that AWS is a great thing. I happen to be a bit of a fan of AWS. I'm not so much a fan of Azure for different reasons. But that's kind of beside the point. It's if you take something which is designed for one thing and kind of use it for another, or you listen too carefully to the very flashy person who turns up in your office and says, look, this will solve all of your problems. Everything we're doing here, everything you're at, I have this thing, this one thing, and it will just make all your problems go away. That's the time to be really, really careful because that's going, you're going to end up in a situation where you're probably tied to one hard technical solution. You may not have a lot of control over what's happening in the back end of that. And more than that, well, we all know silver bullets just kind of don't work. There are some amazing technologies out there. There are some amazing proprietary systems out there. There are some amazing things out there which are completely black box and non-open source. Again, it's not, a method, it's not a methodology so much as a way of thinking. Take an honest look at where it's going to go. Take an honest look at how much you're going to be locked in and how much that is a silver bullet and where it's going to trip you up down the line, not simply because it's the cool thing to do. Which leads me on to another thing which, again, sorry if this offends people, but avoid solutions in search of problems. Again, buzzwords, what I said right at the start. The thing is that AI and ML, very cool right now. Blockchain, awesome. I mean, we all talked about that. The thing is that we end up in a, you can end up rapidly in a situation where you're trying to shoehorn a technology you're excited about or something which you kind of really love and want to play with into the solution of what you're doing when it doesn't actually need it. That's something, again, which you see a lot in consultancy. People get really excited, really, really excited about something like machine learning. And they're like, right, how can we use this to solve a problem? They're like, well, do you, do you need to? Can you? Is it even applicable to what you're trying to do? Blockchain was much the same. The truth is we've had sequential databases since the late 80s. They're not exactly hard. The only thing we had past that point was you know, ubiquitous connectivity, which gave us this idea of distributed state, and blockchain came along. Why do you need to base something on blockchain if the problem domain doesn't actually need it? But again, it's a philosophy. It could well be that something like blockchain or ML is the best solution for what you're trying to do, and it's entirely possible you could even disrupt an entire industry by doing so, but don't use it just because you think it's cool. And don't use it just because you kind of are really excited about te a technology. The minimalist approach is to take an honest look at how you would solve the problem in the least complex way that is still viable. So, to go on, use the right tools and technologies for the job. Can anyone see what's written in that hammer? Maybe not. Okay, it's the PHP hammer. It's the one where you have, uh, you know, kind of like two sides. I don't know if anyone's read, like, you know, why PHP is not my favorite language. Look, PHP can be cool. I'm not necessarily attacking PHP. It really, it's again, it's the philosophy behind this. Sometimes certain technologies are just better at certain things than others. Certain technologies are faster at certain things than others. If you have something which is kind of streaming based, something very event driven, you know, use a language which is not highly transactional in its philosophy. Something like Node.js, something like Golang is probably going to give you better results for something like that than something which is static. Conversely, if you're building a system, or you're architecting or designing the system, which is very much kind of, um, you know, an RPC and not gRPC, that looks very cool. You know, old school RPC where you just make a, a request and it does something and a response comes back and that's kind of the designed limit of the system then why do you need something which is necessarily event-driven? You may get better results going seriously old school. I mean, it's something which I've kind of seen in terms of the fact that everyone builds stuff. The standards kind of stack now is to build an API 
and then have um, a front-end technology, something like Vue.js or Angular um, or, or, God, even Ember old school or React, you know, has it occurred to you that maybe we could go a bit old school and render stuff on the server that might actually have been more efficient? It depends on the problem. I'm not saying you should do that. I'm, not, I'm just saying that maybe think about it. Um, I got unpopular a couple of years ago when I stood up on stage in Auckland and said that people should build monoliths again. And that was, that was really interesting, the idea that we shouldn't have microservices. But in all seriousness, minimum viable solution. Again, if you have something relatively simple and you can build your services in such ways or stateless, what's wrong with putting your entire application in just kind of, you know, one service? It reduces intercall latency. There's all manner of reasons why you can do that. However, think about the problem. It's entirely possible that your solution does require microservices and that sort of stuff. But basically, the philosophy is use the right tools and technologies for the job. Don't, again, shoehorn something which happens to be your engineer's favourite language in there just because that's the capability available to you. Think about the problem. So, the benefits of minimalism in this sort of way. And, again, method of thought. The first thing is it's easier to build. If you spend more time thinking about the sort of stuff which you actually need to do, and the least complex but still viable solution, it's probably going to be simpler than implementing a whole ton of stuff which you might need or shoehorning a lot of integration in from a particular silver bullet vendor or, or something in some way. Easier to build is something which will happen because you are minimalist, because you're going not for the simple solution, but generally overall. Scale, performance and reliability as a default, that's something which just kind of falls out of the back here. The example I put up at the very start, whenever you have a very simple solution, not scalable, it's going to be non-performant whenever you have enough users look, looking at it, and it's not, effective, it's not really very reliable. Using the least complex solution, which is still viable, will give you all of these things out of the bag. Thinking about which languages you're using, the performance about those for the particular use case will give you a better way of thinking about it. Um, easier to maintain. The, it comes down to an old, old adage about literally the, the least lines of code you have, the easier it is for to develop and move on with and to debug and everything else. The least complex solution, I've got 55 seconds, <laughs> will, tend, will tend to be the correct one in that way. And finally, easier to extend. Whenever you're actually taking a look at these systems overall, least complex systems, minimalist systems are easier to look at, easier to see, and easier to extend whenever you do need to add features and capability later on. So, stay minimalist. Um, thank you very much.